whenever he could, he got all the works of a composer. Um, uh, Ippolitov Ivanov gave him an autographed copy of uh, a year in the life of Sh no a, um, a year in the life of Schubert. That's not exactly the title. It's a piece that he wrote in 1928 on the I'm going to get this right. It was the centenary of whose death. Beethoven, 27. It was 27 or 28, yeah. But what happened was that the story goes that Schubert and a bunch of friends go to Beethoven's funeral. And then they all kind of joke, well, who's going to be the next one to die? And there, they wrote, this poem was written on this. And of course, Schubert was the next one to die. But um, uh, Ippolitov Ivanov wrote this piece and gave a, uh, an autographed copy. And we have that in the Fleischer collection. He got that on that trip to the Soviet Union. But anyway, he got all this music. Uh, we got uh, two Icelandic works from John Lifes during that trip. Um, in the 30s, a big uh, project that happened was the WPA. And in the WPA, Works Progress Administration, basically in the United States, this is, of course, it was the, the Depression from 1929, so, so forth. WPA was a government-sponsored uh, project, actually a number of projects over, over many years, mostly involving infrastructure, building roads, building buildings, and things like that. But a big component to this was uh, music. So there were federal music projects all around the country, centered mostly in the big cities. And there was one in Philadelphia, and it was centered around Edwin Fleischer and the Fleischer Collection. So what did they do? Edwin Fleischer, although he loved music, wasn't really up on contemporary music. But his then new curator, Arthur Cohn, you know the name Arthur Cohn? Longtime head of serious music, quote unquote serious music at Carl Fisher. Um, but uh, at that point, in 1935, he was a young whippersnapper and is the new curator of the Fleischer Collection uh, at the library. Arthur Cohn said, well, you know, the collection is nice, but you don't have any contemporary music. you got to have contemporary music. you got to have American music. Uh, you know, it's nice having Schubert and Hippolyte Ivanov and all that stuff. So what they did was um, Arthur got names of composers and enlisted Aaron Copeland to give him names of composers, and names of composers who were at festivals and universities. And they sent letters all around the United States, hundreds of letters, saying, give us your work, and we will copy it. So scores came in from all around the country. And Fleischer hired music copyists to extract the parts. Can you imagine this? <laughs> They had upwards of 70, 80, 90 copyists working uh, at times, just plowing through stuff, opening the scores, copying the parts out. It was proofread. It was supervised. They'd send the scores back to the composer. Now their works and parts were in the Fleischer collection. It was an amazing project. Hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of works came in that way. The other part of it was. Um, Arthur Cohn went to a lecture at the Curtis Institute of Music, which is in Philadelphia, and there was a very interesting musicologist and author, author who was speaking at the Curtis Institute. And Cohn was very taken with him. The guy's name was Nicholas Slonimsky. And they got to talking afterwards. They went out to dinner. And Slonimsky said, you know, uh, your collection is really nice, but what it really needs is Latin American music. Because there's really not a lot of Latin American music in there. He says, you need that. So they went and Cohn talked to uh, um, Edwin Fleischer, the result of which Fleischer bankrolled Slonimsky to visit virtually every uh, country in Central and South America, starting in 1941. He was there for a couple months. 
and he visited composers, libraries, universities, government institutions, and shipped scores and hundreds of scores back to Philadelphia. What we did in Philadelphia was we either photostated them or microfilmed them, shipped them back, and then copied the parts. So we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Latin American pieces, which is why I say we are the largest depository of Latin American orchestral scores and parts uh, in the world, because you know in one place. And it was all done during this time period. So what you have from 1929, when he gave the collection, at that point the, um, the number of orchestral titles was maybe 3,000 through these uh, through, through these uh, collecting forays, you get to the point where now we have 21,000 uh, titles. We are the world's largest lending library of orchestral performance material. So I have to say all those words, okay? So we're a lending library, right? It's orchestral performance materials. Obviously, there are libraries that are, have more titles than we have. The library of Congress, right? BBC. Uh, but as far as scores and parts, uh, for lending them out, we're, we're the biggest in the world. We didn't always lend them out. At first, Fleischer just wanted it to be used by the Symphony Club <laughs> because it was the Symphony Club's library. That got changed, the deed of gift got changed, and so then it, was, it could only be used by people who could come in and pick the stuff up. Then that changed, and so it became an actual lending library uh, in, due, in due course. Um, lots of interesting things happen, you know, around the uh, WPA and other copying projects. And one is the Ives Fourth Symphony. I don't know if anyone knows when. When was the Ives Fourth com uh, first recorded? Anyone know? Premiered and recorded? 1967. Uh, five. Very close. 1965. Yeah. I think I, I can't. He, I think he wrote it around 1919 or something. He probably finished around 1918, 1920. But it was the Stokowski and the American Symphony Orchestra uh, recorded in 65 and it was premiered right around there. And that came about only because it was copied at the Fleischer Collection. Now, I don't know how much you know about Charles Ives or about his manuscripts, <laughs> but it has since been recopied two more times. And so the rental uh, set you get now is not what we have and is not what was recorded. But at the very least, to give you one example, there's one part where uh, you need two conductors um, to conduct it because they're in uh, different rhythm, not only different rhythms, but different meters and so forth. And um, there have been some conductors who have done it now with just by themselves. But at that point, you needed two conductors. And um, they, that came about because of the work at the Fleischer Collection. Because basically, they, they saw this music. They didn't know how to play it. They had no idea how this was going to happen, let alone figure out what notes were the right notes, and what notes were wrong, and what, what should be changed. And is this for the trumpet, or is that for the fourth horn? Because they can't, they're kind of squished together, you know. And all that was done uh, uh, at the Fleischer Collection. The curator at that time was Ted Cedar. Uh, and uh, one of the copyists who did a, a yeoman's job of the copying was uh, Romulus Franceschini, who was my predecessor as assistant curator. When I started there as a copyist, Romulus was the assistant curator, uh, and then he retired, and I, I took his I took his place. So there's the Ives uh, Ives Fourth Symphony. We're always. It's, it, it's always delightful to me when things like that happen, when someone calls us for something like the Sharvenka or uh, a recording uh, project like the Ives uh, happens. And it happens um, uh, over and over again. Uh, 